Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our presentation on Room Pressure Monitors by Antec Controls by Price. Today's webinar is accredited for one professional development hour. After the event, everybody who has attended the webinar will receive an email with a link to request the PDH credit after a short quiz. You can submit questions at any time during today's broadcast using the chat function uh, on your toolbar. We will get to those right at the end of the presentation, but do feel free to ask them along the way. Today's webinar has no costs or cancellation fees associated with it. My name is David Enns. I'm a professional engineer based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I have a bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering from the University of Manitoba, and I act as the business development specialist here at Antec Controls. Today, what I would like to speak to you about are room pressure monitors. So the goal of this course is to introduce the primary uses for room pressure monitors. Where do we use them? Why do we use them? Where must we use them? And what are the different types of way to measure and control for room pressure? So today we'll primarily be talking about healthcare applications, but we will touch on laboratories as well. At the end of the course, you should be able to identify applications that require room pressure measurement. You should be able to apply room pressure monitors in the correct location in a given application. And you should be able to identify the differences between room pressure sensor types. We're gonna spend the first bit of the presentation looking at the applications and applicable standards for where we must and where we might want to use room pressure monitors. Then we'll spend some time talking about the different sensor types that are available in the market. And lastly, we'll spend a bit of time talking about pressure monitors and their uses in controls, which are often separate systems. Again, please ask questions along the way. We will get to those right at the end. So we'll start here with the application types. As with all Antec Controls presentations, we're primarily talking about isolation rooms, operating rooms, compounding pharmacies, and laboratories. These are pressurized environments, and these are where room pressure monitors will be the most useful. Each application is a little bit different. Some require monitors, some can put them to good use, and the room pressures we have to maintain and the locations for those monitors are all a little bit different for each application. But regardless, our goal in all of these spaces is to pressurize a room, to move air from a clean space to a less clean space. Again, regardless of application, to do that, we maintain an offset between supply and exhaust. That then relies on the fact that we build a fairly tightly sealed room and what you get is a balance which creates room pressure. We'll talk more about the controls near the end of the presentation here. Before we get into how to use monitors in these applications and what applications need them, it's important to understand what our role as design engineers actually is. To create room pressure, as I mentioned, we need to use a differential airflow between supply and exhaust. For example, if you understand the leakage rate of a space and can estimate it at, let's say, one square foot, you could create room pressure of 0.01 inches with about 250 CFM of offset airflow. Our job as design engineers is not to ensure we maintain a certain pressure differential at a certain differential airflow for a certain room leakage rate. In the end, that will be what your balancing contractor is responsible for. Our job is to provide a mechanical system capable of pressurizing a space that has variable leakage rates. Leakage rates may change over time, they may change room by room, and they'll change building to building, whether it's a retrofit, new construction, very tight construction, or not. Our job is to provide that mechanical system that could do this work. The standards we're going to reference fairly heavily here today are mainly ASHRAE 170, which is a really great collection for healthcare that covers air change rates, humidity, room pressurization, and a few other things um, for these specialized environments. We'll also touch briefly on USP 797, 
and USP 800. Most importantly in 2019 would be USP 800. It's being updated and it is enforceable December 1st of this year. So we'll touch on that when we come to pharmacies. The first application we should talk about here today is the most simple of the applications presented, and that's the hospital isolation room. These are fairly stable spaces that often act as patient rooms. However, they will have the capability to go into isolation mode and keep somebody isolated from the outside world. The air change rate, as I mentioned, is fairly modest at about 12 air changes per hour. The temperatures are fairly standard. These are fairly easy to control spaces. But we have a few different considerations for the isolation room. The first and foremost is what type of isolation is it? Is it airborne infectious, infectious isolation, or AII? Is it protective environment, known as PE? Or is it the combination of the two? Protective environment with airborne infectious isolation. Some of these will require anti-rooms, and they'll each have different requirements for room pressurization. However, across the three, the requirements for room pressure monitors are the same. ASHRAE 170, as I mentioned, is a really great standard for this. It gives us very, very clear-cut requirements for isolation rooms. So first and foremost, it gives us minimum room pressure differentials. It tells us we need 0.01 inches of water column in each of these spaces. It doesn't mention whether it's positive or negative until you dig into the room type. So airborne infectious isolation will be different than pressure uh, protective environments. However, one thing it's very, very clear about is rooms shall have a permanently installed device to constantly monitor the differential pressure. Isolation rooms require room pressure monitors. You can't have one without the other. You need them in these applications. Generally speaking, those room pressure monitors should provide a local visual means to indicate whether you have negative or positive differential pressure, and ideally will also show the magnitude of that pressure. These spaces, airborne infectious isolation, protective environment, and the combination of the two are all pressurized negative or positively. However, it's important to note ASHRAE 170 also states once a room is negative, for example, it can never go neutral or positive. Negative rooms are required to stay negative. They can have provisions for serving as a standard patient room, and they can become less negative while still meeting the minimums, but a negative room must always stay negative, and a positive room must always stay positive, unless you go through the process of recommissioning these spaces. It's an important note. You cannot switch these rooms from one side to the other. Anti-rooms may be required in these spaces. They aren't always. We will show an application where you do need them here. Uh, you may need them in certain applications, but not others. So let's look at the first of these three, the AII room, Airborne Infectious Isolation Room. Patients housed in these spaces typically have a communicable disease. What they've brought into the hospital can't be shared amongst the rest of the building. They pose a threat to every other occupant in that building, meaning we need to contain what they have inside this space. So these are negatively pressurized rooms. They don't require anti-rooms, as you can see in the image here, so they're often hooked directly to a corridor or working space or something like that. The flow of airflow will be from the corridor into the AII room and then typically into the restroom if it's present. The only threshold where we need to monitor pressure is from the corridor to the isolation space, as you see here. So the application of the room pressure monitor is extremely simple. The sensor should be right where you see the blue arrows, right above the doorway. It's a nice, clean, stable environment to measure pressure from. And the room pressure interface is typically mounted right beside the door. So as you enter that space, you can generally see green is good or red is bad. You can tell if this space is safe to go into or not. Protective environments are essentially the exact opposite. The people that will be in these spaces in the protective environment 
have a compromised immune system, meaning their body cannot handle everything else that exists in a hospital. They can't handle other diseases or anything like that that might have access to their body and their immune system. They just physically can't handle it. So what we need to do is isolate them from the rest of the hospital, meaning we have to blast air out of this space. Protective environments are positively pressurized spaces. Again, it's a very simple application. You don't require an anteroom. So the application of the room pressure monitor is again, extremely simple. The room pressure sensor should typically be right above the door and the room pressure monitor located just to either side of the door, clearly visible to those coming and going from the space. The third type is really just a combination of the two. It's protective environment, with airborne infectious, infectious isolation. The people that will be in these spaces have both issues, meaning they are immunocompromised, but whatever um, disease or what have you that they may have can't have access to the rest of the building. So they need to, number one, be separated from the rest of the building for the building's sake, and they need to be separated from the rest of the building for their own sake as well. So these have more of a physical separation from the rest of the building, meaning they have an anteroom, as you can see on the image. The application for room pressure monitors here isn't any more difficult in reality. The simple fact here is you need two of them. You need to measure pressure from the corridor to the anteroom and from the anteroom to the isolation room. The application of the monitors past that is identical. Room pressure sensors right above the doorway and monitors right at the door, clearly visible to those coming and going. You can get a bit more creative with these in that most digital pressure monitors are able to display multiple sensors on one screen, meaning you can locate the room pressure monitor only in the corridor while measuring pressure at two different interfaces. Most facilities will still go with two displays, one at each threshold, just so you have that clear indicator as you pass through the interlocking doors. The next step up in applications would be the operating room. In reality, they aren't that much more complex. They are still fairly simple spaces as far as HVAC and pressurization is concerned. However, they are a little bit different than the, um, than the isolation room. Operating rooms like the one you see in front of you are very, very common. Whether they have one entrance or two, laminar arrays or air curtains, they're all fairly similar as far as room pressure monitors are concerned. One thing we'll get into with the operating room is the possible need for internal monitoring as well. You can see in the top right there, an example of a monitor like this that can help you do other types of monitoring outside of just pressure. In an operating room, we need to remember what the space is required for, meaning what is the primary form of containment and what is the secondary form of containment. In an operating room, just like in a laboratory or an isolation room, the primary form of containment isn't the room itself. In an OR, the laminar array, that big clean slug of fresh air washing over the patient is your primary form of containment. That's what's doing the most work to ensure that patient is safe while their body is opened up or they have an open wound or something like that. That's the first form of containment. The room itself is secondary containment. What it does is it's positively pressurized to push all air out, preventing air from the rest of the building from accessing that space and reducing the risk that something from the building at large will penetrate through that air curtain or laminar array. So the room is really secondary containment. When we're looking at the operating room, we also have to consider the people using it. Number one is the patient, we need to keep them safe. Then you'll have surgeons and the surgical team who pose a fairly high in and out occupant traffic. Over the course of a one or two or three hour surgery, you might have people coming and going three to four or even 10 times an hour. People move inside and out of these spaces a lot. So we have a high air change rate, high in and out occupant traffic. What we have here is a little bit less stable of a space. However, our room pressure monitor requirements aren't that much different, as I mentioned before. Again, we'll reference back to ASHRAE 170. In the United States, you need to maintain positive 0.01 inches of water column 
in an operating room. Again, this is a minimum for an OR, meaning most facilities will maintain this above 0.01. To give you a bit of a buffer, as the building and fan and room live and breathe, they'll be a little bit above that 0.01. So as the pressure does fluctuate a little bit, which is okay, we still maintain a pressure above that threshold. When you look at ASHRAE 170 a little deeper, it's a little bit odd on its requirement for room pressure monitors. It doesn't technically say you must have a permanently installed room pressure monitor to watch this 0.01 inches. However, it does have a note stating if pressure monitor alarms and devices are installed, we must prevent nuisance alarming. Meaning, when the doors open and close regularly in an operating room, we need to ensure that space isn't constantly going into alarm. When you open a door in an operating room or an isolation room or a pharmacy, you will lose room pressure. It's fairly impractical to maintain room pressurization with an open doorway. Operating rooms are no exception. So if we do install these monitors, we need to prevent those nuisance alarms. When we talk about control near the end of the presentation, we will come back to this topic. All of that being said, looking at the actual text in ASHRAE 170, knowing it doesn't technically call for monitors, all of that being said, I've personally never seen an operating room that doesn't need or have a room pressure monitor. It's generally accepted that we do apply room pressure monitors in the operating room environment. Looking at a standard operating room like the one you see here now, most of them are a single entrance, a single doorway. So again, applying the room pressure monitor is extremely simple. The room pressure sensor should go above the doorway, room pressure monitor to either side of that door to allow um, the employees to know what's going on in that room before they go in. If you have multiple doorways, some of these operating rooms do have two entrances. If the space is outside of them, meaning the corridor you might have on the left and the surgical corridor on the right, if these are both neutral spaces, it might be advisable to only measure pressure in one location. If you're trying to measure the same physical quantity twice, you will get slightly different measurements, meaning don't measure the same thing twice. However, if you are referencing a corridor that's neutral and a surgical corridor on the other side that's slightly more positive or slightly negative, it is perfectly acceptable to monitor pressure in both locations. Now that being said, I mentioned this when we started operating rooms, you might have a requirement to display more information inside the operating room. A lot of surgical teams, a lot of facilities want to see more information inside the room, meaning they don't only want pressure, but they want temperature, air change rate, and humidity. They might even want selectable occupancy, and they might want adjustable temperature all inside the operating room. Typically, that can be handled by what's called a multivariable monitor, meaning these things can display really whatever you'd like them to. They can allow set point adjustment if you'd like, you don't need to, and these are displayed right inside the operating room. Operating rooms aren't small spaces, and we need to see these and view these typically across the room. So often you get a fairly large screen with these. Common sizes are seven or eight inches, up to about 15 inches um, in di uh, across the screen to see that from across the entire room. The next application is the compounding pharmacy. These are an extremely popular topic this year due to the USP 800 standard that's been updated to change some of the requirements we have for what room pressure we control to. If you would like more information on USP 800 and updating compounding pharmacies, we do have a past webinar available at antechcontrols.com on these pharmacies. All of our webinars, including this one after the fact, will be hosted at antechcontrols.com you are still able to get the PD credit after the fact if you email marketing at antechcontrols.com. Now back to the compounding pharmacy. Pharmacies um, that are going in these days are fairly typical spaces. They all look pretty much the same. With some differences between them, most of them do look like that image you see in front of you. 
On the left hand side, you'll have a hazardous drugs compounding space. In the center, an ante room. And on the right hand side, a non hazardous drug mixing space. We can really split compounding pharmacies up three different ways, each of them split into two. We have two of those three ways shown here. The first is what type of room are we looking at? The first thing we need to talk about are buffer rooms. Buffer rooms are where we do the actual mixing, meaning the hazardous drugs and non-hazardous mixing spaces are buffer rooms. Anti rooms are how we access those buffer rooms. The next type is splitting these into sterile versus non-sterile compounding. Sterile compounding is that compounding which needs to be protected from the ingress of microorganisms. This will basically help you select what biological safety cabinet or what primary engineering control to use to mix this drug up. Non-sterile compounding is that that doesn't need to be protected from the ingress of microorganisms. The last type, and we don't show the text here on the slide, however, it's hazardous versus non-hazardous mixing spaces. This is the most important distinction uh, inside the pharmacy. Hazardous drugs are those drugs that we can prove have a net positive to the person they're administered to, meaning that person going through chemotherapy does have a net benefit from taking this drug. However, if you take a step back, the person that mixed that drug up doesn't need that net positive benefit. They can only be harmed by these drugs. So hazardous drugs are those that can hurt people, meaning they can affect your genome, they can be carcinogenic, they can be toxic to the person mixing them up. So we need to better protect those workers from the drugs they're mixing up. That's what's going to occur in a hazardous drugs mixing room. Non-hazardous drugs are, again, everything else that doesn't fall into those categories. Most of the information we have on compounding pharmacies comes from USP 795, USP 797, and USP 800. There is a bit of information in ASHRAE 170. However, it typically refers back to the USP standards um, for reference on pressures and air change rates that will be um, elevated in the USP standards over what ASHRAE 170 requires. The USP standard 797 and 800 both require continuous pressure monitoring. Just like the isolation room application, we must have room pressure monitors in compounding pharmacies. They are an absolute must. For hazardous drugs buffer spaces, we need to maintain minus 0.01 to minus 0.03 inches of water column. Now, here's where we have our first difference between the compounding pharmacy and the previously presented applications. These are not minimums, these are ranges. In isolation rooms, it was minimum 0.01. Operating rooms were the same with a minimum of positive 0.01 inches. Hazardous drugs mixing spaces are minus 0.01 to minus 0.03. That range basically dictates that we need to target 0.02 inches of water in that space. That doesn't give you a lot of leeway on the low and high side to let that room fluctuate on its room pressure. You will see some of that fluctuation. It does naturally occur. We have to keep it fairly tightened down and not allow too much fluctuation in there. This doesn't really affect how we monitor pressure, but it is important for the control of those spaces. For anti rooms and non hazardous spaces, we maintain positive pressures in the range of 0.02 and above uh, inches of water column. Again, those are a little bit more simple. You get a wider, bigger range, and you get a minimum in those spaces. So let's look at a few options or a few layouts of different pharmacies that we might have. The first is a non sterile compounding pharmacy. There's no anti room required because it's a non sterile pharmacy. So we can go directly from the corridor into that buffer space. This is a negatively pressurized space with 12 air changes per hour and a room pressure of minus 0.01 to minus 0.03 inches. Inside a non sterile pharmacy, you'll typically find a class one biological safety cabinet. That's typically a constant volume device. These are just like isolation rooms and operating rooms. The placement of the room pressure monitor 
and sensor are pretty much identical right beside and above the door there. The next type of pharmacy you might see is a sterile compounding pharmacy. As soon as we look at sterile compounding, a few things change. Number one, we require 30 air changes per hour, and we require an anteroom that is also 30 air changes per hour. So now that we have two spaces, we have a pressure cascade, meaning pressure cascades from the buffer room to the anteroom and the anteroom out to the corridor. The application of the individual pressure monitors is again identical. You can see the display right beside the doorway and the sensor right above the door. However, you have two options for where to measure or monitor the pressure. What you see on the screen here, meaning measuring from the corridor to the anteroom and the anteroom to the buffer room is the most common. Exactly as it's drawn is what you most commonly see. You do have the option, however, it isn't very common, but you do have the option of measuring from the corridor to the anteroom and from the corridor to the buffer room. This is a little bit more stable and helps you sometimes diagnose problems because wherever the issue occurs, whether a motor has died out or a valve is doing something it's not supposed to or the controls are just overtuning the room, Whatever may be the cause, you can directly diagnose which room it's happening in. Now the downside to this is the pressures you see in the standards, the 0.01 to 0.03 or the positive 0.02, aren't directly now what you will measure. You have to infer the correct pressure you measure in those spaces. So while it's a little bit easier for the startup commissioning and balancing and the um, diagnostics on the space if it malfunctions, it's a little bit harder for the staff who actually have to monitor this space. The next type of pharmacy is really the combination of these, and that has non-hazardous on the right and hazardous mixing on the left. Again, your specific layout might change a little bit, but generally speaking, this is what they look like. What they look like. These are identical to the combination of what you saw before. So the hazardous drugs room on the left is negative pressure to the anteroom. The non-hazardous is positive relative to the anteroom. Again, the application of room pressure monitors is identical. But again, referencing that last image we saw, you can put those monitors in different locations. The most common is what you see here, with a pressure sensor above each doorway measuring that cascaded pressure. You do still have the option of measuring from the buffer room to the corridor and the ante room out to the corridor directly, but then you must infer the correct pressure that you're monitoring and controlling to. A little bit harder to do for the facility staff. Once you start getting a pharmacy that looks like this with three pressure sensors and multiple monitors, you can start to get creative with how you measure and display this information. As I referenced before, a lot of digital pressure monitors are capable of displaying multiple rooms at one time. They can typically display up to three pressure sensors at a single time. So what you could do in this space is mount either inside the anteroom or out in the corridor a single room pressure monitor and then bring back to it three room pressure sensors mounted where you see the blue arrows on this screen. This does save you a little bit of cost but it does take a little bit of information away from the pharmacist working in these spaces. Meaning, you only get that um, information when you cross into the anteroom. You don't see it past that point. So again, most facilities will go with the three monitors and the three sensors as you see on the image. If you think back again, however, to the operating room where we had that multivariable monitor that showed more information at a remote location, that can be extremely powerful in the compounding pharmacy as well. If you consider the head pharmacist or the supervisory staff that works out in the corridor or the, the workroom out there, they may want to monitor room pressure in all three spaces. They may want to measure or monitor temperature and humidity and air change rate and see alarms at a remote station. Those multivariable monitors are very useful in that regard as well. So typically what you'll see in a modern pharmacy are the monitors that you see on the screen as well as a remote nurse's station or remote station at somebody else's desk for monitoring these rooms as well.
As questions come in here throughout the presentation, we will review those and we will come back to them right at the end of the presentation here. Do please keep submitting them and we thank you guys for asking questions. Just to close out the compounding pharmacies application, you can have a combination pharmacy that is non-sterile and sterile compounding. These require different primary engineering controls, meaning different biological safety cabinets essentially, and there's a cleaning exercise to go between them and requirements for the placement of those spaces. As far as looking at the room pressure monitors themselves, again, they are applied identically to the other applications. So now we've talked about the applications we work in, isolation rooms, operating room, and compounding pharmacies. We haven't touched too much on laboratories, however. In a laboratory, there isn't a requirement to install a permanently uh, installed room pressure monitor. However, they are fairly commonly applied. Room pressure is a good diagnostic tool in the laboratory environment to ensure we're maintaining that room pressure and to ensure that the building does have an idea of what the pressure in the space is, they're just a little less common than in healthcare. Moving on now from where do we apply room pressure monitors and where do we put them, we need to look at the different types of monitors and more importantly, the different type of sensors that are available. Regardless of the type, however, generally what we ask of the room pressure monitor is to give a visual indication of room pressure. We sometimes also want audible alarms, meaning when you go out of that range that's prescribed, we do want to hear some sort of alarm, and we generally want these to integrate with our building automation system as well. The two types you may see are a more legacy product, sometimes known as a ball and tube indicator, or a more modern digital monitor. The ball and tube indicator is still an effective way to see pressurization direction. These do tell you if a room is positive or negative, but they don't tell you the magnitude of room pressurization, meaning you can't tell if the room is 0.01 or 0.1 inches. You will know if it's positive or negative, but you can't tell the magnitude. They aren't affected by power outages because there's no power applied. However, they do have a bit of an antiquated uh, appearance and they don't integrate with a building automation system, quite obviously. So what most facilities are going with are digital monitors this day and age. These give you a visual and audible indication of room pressure, and they'll actually tell you the magnitude of pressure. Most of these will let you display what the current room pressure is, and you can typically adjust the averaging with which we measure or display that room pressure at. You can generally have multiple alarm set points, meaning high and low alarms. You can have high and low cautions as well. And these can integrate with the building management or automation system, giving you good trending data for the compounding pharmacy operating room and isolation room, which is sometimes needed and required. Now that's the monitor. We need to make a separation here before we go any farther and separate different types of variables. And there's three variables we need to talk about. The first is the measured variable. Measured variable in our case will be the room pressure. It's something we measure and often display, but the, the physical act of measurement is performed by one device. For us, that will be a sensor. The next variable is a monitored variable. For us, again, that's typically pressure, but it can be something like humidity or temperature as well, or even air change rate. Monitored variables, by our definition, is something we then display. So often with a room pressure sensor, we will measure it with a sensor and display it with a monitor. However, those are physically separate parts and they don't need to be used together always. We can measure pressure and then not report it to a user. It might just be for the facility staff or it may be the third type of variable and that's a controlled variable we can use pressure as the actual controlled variable in these spaces. We're gonna come back to that at the end of this course here. So let's go back to that first type, the measured variable. How you measure pressure is different and there are different types of room pressure measuring sensors and there are really typically three types. Let's start with the first one you can see in front of you and that's the diaphragm sensor. 
These are sometimes called DP sensors or static pressure sensors. These are the most common type you'll see in the market. Um, and, and we'll see them more often than, than the other two types. The nice thing about a diaphragm sensor is it's what we called a dead-ended sensor, meaning airflow doesn't physically pass through the room pressure sensor. So there really isn't any potential for contamination from lint or dust or dirt. Those really just don't affect something that doesn't pass air through it. What a, what a diaphragm sensor does is it's a physical barrier between two, two gases. In our case, that gas is air. As pressure is higher on one side from that air, that physical separation, that membrane will deflect. It'll be pushed away from that, that higher pressure. If you can measure that deflection, you can then infer what the magnitude of pressure is pushing on one side over the other. That is what a diaphragm sensor will do. It physically sets those air, separates those airflow streams. Now this is great, as I mentioned, because there isn't any potential for sensor contamination. However, that physical barrier, that membrane, can physically change over time. It can mechanically change. Meaning, we do sometimes need to recalibrate or re-zero a diaphragm sensor. So they don't need to be cleaned, but they do need to be maintained and recalibrated every three to six months. Generally speaking, this is coming from the ASHRAE uh, standards and guidelines as well. These are not as accurate as the next two type of sensors we're going to talk about. The next type is the hot wire anemometer. Hot wire anemometers are very, very accurate pressure measurement devices. They are more accurate than a diaphragm sensor. There is no physical separation of the airflow streams here. There isn't something that's being pushed or stretched or pulled to measure this pressure. So there really isn't anything to drift over time. However, hot wire anemometers do pass airflow through and over the sensing elements. That's how they measure pressure, which we'll talk about in a moment. So the first thing to talk about is there is risk of sensor contamination here. As lint and dust and dirt pass over the sensor, they, they can collect on the sensing elements, they can reduce the diameter that the air flows through, and basically they need to be cleaned, again, every three to six months. So they will also require a very similar maintenance cycle, but for a very, very different reason. What a hot wire anemometer does is based purely on heat transfer. There's a simple principle in thermodynamics that energy will transfer, for, will transfer from a warmer device to a cooler device, or from a hot wire into a cool airflow stream. So if we heat a wire up using a set voltage, amperage, or temperature, all three variables are things you can measure in a hot wire anemometer. If we heat these up to a set temperature, for example, and pass a cool airflow stream over them, we can measure how much electrical energy it takes to get us back to that known set condition, meaning how much more amperage or temperature do you need to provide to get you back to that known condition. The amount of heat energy that transfers between the two, between the hot wire and the air, can let you infer how much pressure there is, meaning how quick the air is flowing. That's how a hot wire anemometer actually measures pressure. The last device is similar to a hot wire anemometer while still being different. A thermal MEM sensor is based on thermal dispersion. So it is still measuring the drifting of heat ener energy, but it's not directly measuring a voltage or amperage or temperature. A thermal MEMS device is a thermal dispersion device shrunk down to a micro scale. These still pass airflow or a gas through a chamber. It's just a very, very small chamber. What these do is they will measure the temperature of an incoming gas. You can see the temperature sensors as gas flows from the left to the right. You can see the first temperature sensor on the left there. So you get a baseline temperature reading. Then what you can do is you can heat that gas up giving it a set known electrical heat input. Then what you can do is as that gas passes over the heater, energy will be transferred to the gas. And then you can measure that temperature again. The higher the temperature you measure farther away, the more airflow or the more gas is passing through this chamber. 
That lets you then infer again or calculate how much pressure there is between the two sides of the sensor. So it's similar to a hot wire anemometer, but it is different. However, because it's a similar-ish principle, you still get that high resolution and very high accuracy as you would get on a hot wire anemometer. Now, remember the issue with the hot wire anemometer. They need to be clean because they do pass airflow through the device. With a thermal MEM sensor, one of the most important parts is the silicon wafer you can see called out on the image here. The temperature sensors and the heating elements are encased in a silicon wafer. They are pulled out of the airstream. They don't have physical access to the airstream to collect lint or dust or dirt. So these are much, much more resistant to contamination. And just like the hot wire anemometer, there isn't a risk of drift in these devices because there's nothing to physically change or stretch or move in these devices. So what you get with a thermal MEM sensor is a maintenance-free device. Now to say that, you should back this up with some test data. So here at the factory, we've had a test running for about six years. The, the better part of the first year of data is shown here on, on the slide. Any good scientific experiment has a control um, variable. For us, we call this an MKS diaphragm sensor. So if you remember the first technology we presented, these are dead-ended devices that don't pass airflow through them. In green, that's what we're using here, is an extremely high-grade diaphragm sensor. These would be exceptional for room pressure measurement if they weren't much too expensive for the application. They're just not well suited to this due to their cost. The diaphragm sensor, again, shown in green is our reference. So you can see if we pressurize the box, which is what we did here, we were measuring 0.01 inches, or actually just above 0.01 inches, for about 250 days. You can see a little bit of noise as that box breathed a little bit, but you do get a fairly average and stable signal from that MKS diaphragm sensor. In green is the thermal MEM sensor in this, uh, same box. So you can see you get a little bit less noise, but you get the same trend line for box pressure in this test. The last one is the hot wire anemometer shown in red. Now, before we present the hot wire anemometer, we need to explain a little bit more about what was going on inside of this pressurized box in this experiment. What we did here was we pressurized the box and put in what's called ASHRAE test dust number one. And it's a black sooty substance basically meant to replicate everything in an exhaust or in an HVAC application. It's meant to clog up pressure sensors like this. So we swirl that around this box constantly. Again, it's been running for about six years to see what happens to our pressure signal and does it degrade over time. So with the MKS diaphragm sensor, you, you see exactly what you expect. The lint or the dust doesn't have any effect on it over time. As it's a very high grade sensor, the drift is extremely minimal and you don't see really any of it over time. The thermal MEM sensor is still a flow through sensor, but is extremely resistant to contamination based on that silicon wafer and pulling those measuring elements out of the airstream. That's how you see it maintain that same constant average pressure. The hot wire anemometer, however, is a flow through device where in directly in the airstream are your sensing elements. So what you can see in red is as this dust swirled around and passed over and through this device, you do get a degrading pressure signal over time. This is how you know you need to clean hot wire anemometers over time. Every three to six months, they do need to be cleaned out and blown out to ensure that lint and dust and dirt isn't really and actually affecting the, uh, the pressure measurement. Now, the last thing we'd like to touch on before we open the floor to some questions here at the end of the presentation is how do we use room pressure monitors in controls. In the end, our goal is to control room pressure, and room pressure monitors are a portion of that. There are two ways really to control room pressure. There's airflow offset control and pressure control. Both types, as we presented earlier, use an offset between supply and exhaust. If you'd like a positive space, you need to supply more than you exhaust. 
It's a, a fairly simple way to do this is airflow offset control. This is the most common type of control. All airflow offset control, sometimes called volumetric offset, all it does is it adds up all of its supply air, adds up all of its exhaust air, and maintains a set distance between those two. Maybe we tell it to maintain 100 CFM of offset. If we give it 100 CFM of supply, we'll then get 900 CFM of exhaust. This is extremely stable and an extremely effective way of creating room pressure. However, airflow offset control doesn't measure the room pressure it creates. It doesn't really care what pressure it creates. It's entirely independent from room pressure, actually. The reason this is so common is whether it's standard speed or high speed, healthcare or labs, regardless of the valve or terminal type that creates these airflows, the math is still just as simple. Airflow offset control remains constantly simple to do, but it is independent of room pressure. So often what you'll see is airflow offset control combined with room pressure monitoring as a separate system. The control system is responsible for maintaining a CFM offset and completely separate and standalone from that, the room pressure monitor is required to watch that room pressure and report that out to the building network and the users. So you might get a control system that maintains a 100 CFM offset and a room pressure monitor that constantly measures it and displays 0.01 inches of pressure. That's a very common and effective approach for all of the applications we've talked about so far. There is another strategy you can employ, and it can be effective in certain applications. This is called pressure control. It's a little bit confusing because both types create pressure. However, one of the types is called pressure control. And the reason it's called pressure control is because the controlled variable, this is what we talked about earlier, is actual room pressure. Room pressure will be controlled regardless of the offset that's required. Room pressure control at eight o'clock in the morning might need 55 CFM to get 0.01 inches. Later in the day, it might require 100 CFM to get 0.01 inches. The room pressure control strategy is only responsible for hitting the pressure number, regardless of the offset it requires. So this is where you get a more accurate control system. Your pressure will always be exactly what you're targeting. However, you get a little bit less stable of a control system. It'll constantly tweak and tune those airflows to make sure you hit that room pressure. Now the nice part of this is as your construct construction slowly changes over time, maybe your door seals change or your, your leakage rate and construction change in the room, room pressure control will deal with that, where volumetric offset or airflow offset control will not. The downside to this is pressure control can go out of control. And what we're talking about here are doorways. Room pressure control needs door contact control as well. We spoke about this earlier, but it's impractical to, to design a system that can maintain room pressurization through an open doorway. It just really doesn't happen with any, any current system you design. If you take a step back a few seconds in time, before a door opens in a pressure controlled space, that room is typically working. It's providing an appropriate offset to hit the pressure we want and provides a modestly stable environment. When the door opens, room pressure is lost. We know that about that space. So when the door closes again, we very likely want the airflow control system to be right back where it was before the door opened. So the most effective strategy in dealing with doorways is when the door opens, freeze your pressure control loop. Tell all of your air valves and terminals to stop moving. When the door is closed again, they can resume that control and get back to doing the job they were doing well before the door opened. So for pressure control, door contact switches are a must in these applications. As well, the last piece of equipment, it might sound silly today to say, but it is required. The last piece of equipment you really truly need in pressure control is a room pressure sensor. You can't control to a room pressure if you're not measuring it. Airflow offset control that we presented first doesn't technically require it. So in summary, we talked about the applications being compounding pharmacies, 
operating rooms, isolation rooms, and a little bit about labs that can use room pressure monitors and sensors. Each of them has different pressures we need to hit, prescribed in ASHRAE 170 and the USP standards for pharmacies. We talked about where we can apply those monitors and how we can apply them. And we talked a little bit about the different types of room pressure sensors you can use and how we deal with their drift and contamination over time. Lastly, we talked a little bit about room pressure controls and how they can use these sensors and monitors and how we can effectively control room pressure, knowing now what we know about pressure monitors. With that, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and open the floor to any questions. We'll wait about 30 seconds to a minute here for some questions to come in. In the meantime, if you have any further questions after the fact, please reach out to us at applications at antechcontrols.com. Again, this webinar will be hosted on antechcontrols.com as are all of our past engineering webinars. You can still get PD credits for those as well. Again, reach out to the applications group at antechcontrols.com. We did get one question coming in about the USP standards in compounding pharmacy, and do we need to trend that data? The, the standard isn't super strict on this. What the, the USP 800 and 797 standards require is that you record the data once per day. That's not very often. Um, a lot can happen in a day. What we're seeing much more commonly in pharmacies is trend data every 15 minutes or so. Um, with a thir certain threshold needing to be within those pressure requirements. So you might need 85 or 90 or 95% of, of samples in a given time period to be within that room pressure requirement. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. Again, my name is David Enns with Antec Controls. Please let us know if you have any questions at applications at antechcontrols.com. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and have a great day.